All right. So let's get this started. Let me see if I can get the lights a little bit more somewhat adjusted. There we go. All right. So, okay. Might be over there. Cool. We did do a room switch before the semester, so you should be over there. I, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's your fault. <laughs> yeah. This is civil engineering materials. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Day one. <laughs> we are Marshall. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I like this job. <laughs> All right, uh, let, let's get into uh, the wonderful world of civil engineering materials. If you've never had me before, I'm Dr. Michelson, and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. I think most of you have either had me for some of the freshman courses or at least know who I am, so, um, so we'll just jump right into stuff. Um, on my syllabus, which I emailed out to everybody and is also available on Blackboard, um, I said my office hours are going to be uh, determ uh, to be determined. I've go ahead. I've gone ahead and picked those. I have Monday and Wednesday from one to three, and Tuesday and Thursday from nine to eleven. I wanted to try and cross a few different class periods to try and apply to as many students uh, as possible. Um, if for some reason you've got a, a pressing issue and you need to speak and you can't meet those times, just send me an email and we'll we'll work something out. Um, I'm going to be giving you all a homework on Thursday. I don't have anything for you today, but the homework's just going to be on some introductory basic stuff before we start digging into the wonderful world of CD materials. Um, I need to mention this now. So this course obviously has a lab component with it. Um, we are going to be having lab on Thursday. Um, there are some safety related uh, concerns or issues and policies that you need to follow, but they're not they're not the biggest deal in the world. The only thing uh, that is a must for Thursday is that you wear closed-toed shoes, okay? So no sandals, okay? Um, there are going to be, I mean, we're going to be, we're going to have some stuff that we're going to be lifting and moving around, and if it drops and hits your, your toes, that's not a good day. So just make sure that you wear closed-toed shoes. I would also um, recommend that you don't wear uh, Gucci or Versace or anything that you don't mind getting a little dusty. I mean, this, this course, we are going to be dealing with aggregate and concrete and things like that. So there's going to be some dust going around in the lab uh, and whatnot. Um, but I'll talk a little bit uh, in more specific details as we, as we move on. Just, uh, uh, just make sure you're wearing stuff that you don't mind getting a little dusty or a little dirty. Um, uh, so today we're going to talk about the course operation. And I'm also going to maybe go a little bit back and sort of review some stuff uh, on stress and strain. From mechanics of the formable bodies, because I know you all love that stuff. Greatest class you've ever had, right? So um, we'll, we'll go back and sort of review some of this stuff because those concepts are going to be very important. I'm not going to expect you all in here to do really complex engineering 216 problems, but being able to fundamentally understand what is stress and what is strain is going to be pretty important for this class. So we kind of need to go back and just get everybody brushed up, make sure everybody's up to speed. Um, and what have you. Okay, so um, let me get into uh, let me just get into some stuff with the uh, the syllabus. Uh, I've got the syllabus, and I can pull that up if anybody has any questions. But I've got this sort of intro PowerPoint to sort of highlight the big ticket items that are on the syllabus. Um, let's see. First thing that that ought to be mentioned is the grade distribution. Now, this class does have a lab, so uh, make no mistake, there are going to be laboratory assignments associated with this class. But um, I went back uh, in, in my head and, and started to remember times that I taught lab courses. My, my first semester, I taught geomatics. And I'd remember there'd be times I would go into the class, you know, it'd be like week seven or something. I'd say, OK, guys, you've got homework seven due on Wednesday. You've got field lab four due this day. You've got CAD lab due this day. We have a field exam this day, a lecture exam. And it became so much stuff that even I had a hard time keeping track of it. So I think what I'm going to do for this semester is um, instead of saying, you know, there's a laboratory component and a, a homework component and all this, is I'm just going to lump it all together and just have one single line item uh, on your grades and on your assignments. I think it'll, 
be a lot easier for everybody to track. So, you know, like homework two might be something out of the book, and homework three might be a lab assignment or a lab report. So it'll all just be the same thing. I think it'll be a lot easier to track, and everybody will be able to keep up with stuff. With all the other classes that you've got going on this semester, I figured every little bit helps. So you'll probably still be doing, the, it'll you know, be the same amount of work. It'll, uh, I think it'll just be a different way of uh, doing bookkeeping. Uh, I am going to have a small attendance grade. I've got the attendance sheet going around. I think uh, most people are, are working their way towards signing that. Um, the book, the book is Materials for Civil and Construction Engineers by Mamluk and Zanuski. Um, we're using the third edition, uh, which actually might be somewhat beneficial for you all because they've recently updated this, so they're, they're using the fourth edition. So you might be able to find this for somewhat a little cheaper. So that always works out for students. I, uh, I know that's a, that's a plus. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about uh, just course policy and, and procedures and whatnot. Let's talk about attendance. So um, I, I would say the big uh, point to make, and I know this seems a little silly, but just make sure you sign the attendance sheet. Uh, it, it never uh, uh, fails. You know, there'll be a student who comes up in uh, December and they'll say, well, how come I don't have 100% home or attendance average? And I'll pull up the, the, the attendance sheet, so I go, well, I see you didn't sign in on September 15th or something. I say, well, I was there. I say, well, that was three months ago. So, uh, so just make sure that you sign in. It makes uh, everything easier for, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for bookkeeping down the line. Um, in terms of the lectures, uh, you might have noticed a little countdown on the screen. Uh, I'm actually recording this lecture right now. I, know I, I do this. I know Dr. Waite does this. Uh, so a, a number of your faculty might do this as well. Um, I'm recording these lectures right now. So the screen's being recorded. My voice is being recorded. I'm also going to do the problems on this. So I'm actually not going to use the board so that when you pull the video up, you can actually see the, the problems being done. A few of you have had me for class before, and I think that worked out. Uh, that worked out pretty well. This is all going to be collected onto YouTube on a single YouTube playlist. Um, that link is on Blackboard right now. Um, the videos take a, a little bit to upload, and I have to go and actually add it onto the playlist, so it might not show up, you know, right then and there. Um, but as soon as the videos upload, I keep them public. So if you go to my YouTube channel, they'll they'll be right there, so they'll be pretty easy to uh, uh, to find. <laughs> so if for some reason you miss a day, I highly obviously recommend that you don't. But if you do, I mean, life happens, I understand that, um, you can catch up on Blackboard. Uh, speaking of Blackboard, I'm going to use Blackboard very heavily uh, this semester. I'm trying to be a, a little greener and a little uh, more uh, 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 eco-friendly, I guess, if that's the best way, or best way to put it, uh, in terms of my classes. So if you notice, I actually didn't print out the syllabus. I emailed it to everybody, and it's posted on Blackboard, so everybody can access it at any time. I have no problem whatsoever if you want to bring a laptop to class. That's absolutely fine. If you want to bring a laptop or a tablet or something like that and pull up the notes, that's absolutely fine. But, uh, I, but I am going to be using uh, Blackboard quite heavily. I'm going to post the grades on Blackboard, homework assignments, lab uh, handouts and whatnot. Everything will be there. Uh, I also, I guess I should note that um, while I'm doing my best to be as green as possible uh, with this course, I can't be completely green. Um, like, you know, there is a lab component with this class, and so uh, as we do lab, we'll have, you know, data sheets and whatnot that we need to fill out. So we'll probably distribute those during lab, and then you all can fill them out uh, as lab uh, moves forward. <coughs> so um, my thoughts and my plan uh, is to have extras right outside my office. If you don't know where my office is, my office is on the second floor of this building. If you go this way, there's a long line of faculty offices. Mine's the last one on the left. It's pretty easy to find. I've got a little cart outside my office door, and I'll keep spare handouts and whatnot on there. Speaking of that, I, I, I don't have this in the, in the notes, but it's something I actually just thought of. There are a couple times when, during lecture, we're going to be working on, on some handouts and whatnot together. Um, one of the very fundamental skills that you will learn in this class is how to do a sieve analysis, which is a, a, a very important way of classifying aggregates, things like gravel and sand and whatnot. And in order to do it, you need a very particular template, which I'll provide you all. But you also need a straight edge. So it's probably not a bad idea to bring a straight edge or something like that to class. But I'll try and give you a little bit of a heads up when those days uh, uh, are approaching. Uh, any questions so far? Look good? Okay. 
Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about homework and exams. Uh, homework, um, I'll assign that during lecture, and I'll, I'll, I'll have it posted on uh, Blackboard. Um, it'll typically be due uh, one, uh, usually one week after it's assigned. Sometimes it's a little more. Um, just make sure you have it turned in on time. There will be three exams total, and let me go ahead and say this. I am in no way, shape, or form a comprehensive exam guy, and this is a perfect example of a class where that's going to work out really well. For instance, our first exam is going to be on uh, introductory content and on aggregates. And then once we finish that, we're done, and we move on to a new topic for exam two. So it's, I don't do comprehensive exams. I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of it. Now, because, uh, just because I don't do comprehensive exams doesn't mean that there aren't a few topics here and there that you need to understand moving forward. For instance, stress and strain. It's going to show up on every test. Uh, there's no way of avoiding that. So uh, make sure that you're uh, uh, aware of that. Um, for your exams, I allow you to use an 8.5 by 11 formula sheet. You can put whatever you want on that formula sheet, except for worked out examples. And that's probably not really going to be a big deal with this class, because a lot of what this class is about is procedures and methods, and then just general facts about civil engineering materials. So that's probably not going to be the biggest deal in the world uh, with this class. Um, before I talk about lab, let me pull something up real quick. I've got here the syllabus. And I want to show you what I'm going to do with the exams. So um, this is uh, our first exam. Um, <coughs> unlike uh, uh, unlike you know, some of my other courses, the exams in this course, the, the dates are, are fairly uh, set in stone. The reason why is because the exam schedule really does revolve around what we're doing in the lab. So we have to sort of uh, keep on top of that. So this is a very typical exam uh, schedule that I like to do. So the first exam will be uh, September 28th. So this is what's going to happen. On Tuesday, September 26th, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to talk about uh, what's going to be on the exam, format of the exam, what topics you need to understand, a very high level. And then I basically shut up and let you all ask whatever questions you want. You can ask anything. We can go through uh, facts about materials, we can go through homeworks, examples, whatever you want, okay? You can even ask me what the answer to problem one is. I won't tell you, but you can ask, so you, you can, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, now, I have here that on uh, uh, that day, we're going to have the exam, and then we're going to have the, the lab. But I'm probably going to do this in reverse. See, this particular day, all we're doing is uh, breaking some mortar cubes that we cast in the lab the week before. So what we're probably going to do is we'll meet at 1230, but we'll meet in the lab. We'll go, we'll break our mortar cubes, and then once we're done with that, we'll come in here and do our exam. Um, you notice we had uh, a little bit of a chuckle over the students who were in the wrong room. That was partially my fault, and the reason why is... Um, anybody who's in ASC right now will tell you that room space this semester is, is damn difficult to find. And for some reason, this room is available from like 2 to 3 and 2 on. So I figured this would be the room that, uh, that would be perfect for this class because we could sort of have a, a quick huddle meeting before lab in here and then move on. But it can also serve a double purpose because we can go in the lab do testing, and then come in here and do our exams. Or if it comes down to it, we'll do the exams in the lab. I don't think that's really a, a big deal. But I wanted to do exams on Thursdays because I'm not a time cruncher either. I don't like giving you a four-hour long exam and giving you 50 minutes to do it. That's not a pleasant experience for you. It's not a pleasant experience to grade. Um, so anybody have any questions about, about that or the schedule, anything like that? Okay. Um, <laughs> probably what we will do for lecture and lab, especially on Thursdays, is we'll probably lecture from 12.30 to 1.45, and then we'll probably break for 10 or 15 minutes, let you all go use the restroom, just not be around me for, for, for 15 minutes. You civil engineering students are going to get to know me real well this semester, so <laughs> any breaks from Dr. Michelson, I'm sure, are, are, are well appreciated. <laughs> So um, we'll probably meet from 12.30 to 1.45, take a 15-minute break, come back in here, discuss what we need to discuss with lab. We'll probably have some safety discussions each week. Make sure you know you're wearing your safety glasses and make sure you're watching, you know, pinch points and things like that. And then we'll go and do lab and, and leave. So sound good? 
Again, I haven't assigned lab groups yet. I wanted to wait in case there were a few stragglers that hadn't registered for classes yet, but I'll, I'll get that divvied up uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the week progresses. All right. So <laughs> again, in regards to laboratory and laboratory assignments, so they're going to be, like I said, sort of mixed in with homework assignments. And that's not to say you're not going to do the work. I just genuinely, genuinely believe it is going to be easier from a bookkeeping standpoint. Now, this is a lab class, and you're going to be in a lab group. So some of the assignments will be turned in as a group. And I think that's going to be a little easier on you all. And I think it's going to be a little easier uh, across the board. So our final concrete testing report, I mean, we're going to be doing a series of mixed designs throughout the semester and a series of tests as the semester progresses. So you all are going to have a lot of data. I'm just going to have you all turn that in as a group. So instead of getting 32 reports, I'm only going to get six. Okay. So that'll be up to you all to decide how you want to, uh, to do that. Um, and again, lab group assignments uh, are going to, they're there to come. Uh, we'll meet in this room before lab. Big thing, make sure you really do follow all the posted safety regulations. I mean, it's not, I, I don't want you to think that you're, you know, walking into a, a danger zone or anything. But, I mean, we are talking about, you know, lifting concrete samples and whatnot. They fall, they hit your foot. That's not a good time. So make sure you're wearing closed-toed shoes. Make sure you're wearing clothes that you don't generally mind getting a little bit dusty. And uh, when we do cement mixing or concrete mixing, it's probably a good idea to wear pants those days. It can tend to splash and, and, and get on you. So, um, Any questions? All right, good? Everybody excited? Now that was a different, different response. <laughs> All right, so... Since you're so excited, I figured I would, I would spend the, uh, the, the first day talking about mechanics of deformable bodies, because that's such an awesome topic, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, don't worry. I, I think you're going to find that, that, that what I require of you uh, uh, and what knowledge that I expect that you retain from, from mechanics of deformable bodies is fairly basic. I mean, mechanics of deformable bodies is meant to, you know, sort of stretch your capacity on, on, on that topic, but in the end, we really just need some fundamental basics uh, in order to, uh, to move forward. But I want to talk about some basics in regards to materials engineering, um, you know, some common civil engineering materials, some materials we're going to use this semester and, and learn about this semester, why you pick some materials over others, um, and just get into the general swing of things with, with civil engineering materials. So what are some common civil engineering materials that we're going to use uh, throughout this semester? You know, sometimes you might hear me say civil engineering materials. Sometimes you might hear me say construction materials. But essentially what I'm talking about is any material that is going to be uh, used or uh, that comprises the built infrastructure and more or less anything that's going to be subjected to some kind of physical demand. So aggregates, you know, things like gravels and sands, uh, Portland cement concrete. Um, steel, uh, things like precast concrete, uh, wood, timber, you know, asphalt, um, also soils, although we have a whole class devoted just to, to soils because that's its own uh, unique uh, uh, science in and of itself. I mean, there are some less common materials that are worth mentioning. I mean, things like aluminum, things like plastics, things like uh, fiber reinforced polymers uh, that are becoming a little more uh, used nowadays. They're not really the, the, the main bulk of what it is we, we use in civil, uh, as civil engineers. The stuff on the left, that's what we're using all day, every day, and that's the stuff that you need to understand by the time that you leave this class. So um, <coughs> a couple things, and I'm going to talk about some of these in more details, but why you pick one material over another. I mean, we are engineers, and it is our job, uh, above all, to ensure the safety and the welfare of the public. So. I always like to use this example. If I'm a bridge engineer and I'm designing a highway bridge and I know that when that bridge is designed and in service that my grandma is going to be driving over that bridge every day to get groceries and get, you know, getting her mail from the post office box. And I think, well, gosh, I don't want anything to happen to grandma. So I'm going to design that bridge to be massive. It's going to have a crazy amount of reinforcement. The beams are going to be 10 foot deep. Nothing's happening to grandma, okay? But what's the problem with that bridge? It's too expensive. It's too expensive. And, and in the world of, of bridge engineering, I mean, who, who eats that cost? Who's the client? But 
So what does that mean? We are the client, yeah, the, the taxpayers. So while the engineers have a, um, a responsibility, a primary responsibility above all others to ensure the safety and the welfare of the public, once that's taken care of, we still have to design systems that are economical. And, and what materials that we use is one of the fundamental questions that needs to be answered before you begin some project. So why pick some materials over others? Well, there's a whole number of reasons. Economic factors are a big one. What about other properties of that material? Mechanical properties, non-mechanical properties, and we'll talk about the specifics as we get into this. Um, aesthetic properties, I mean, if, if you're in the world of architecture and building construction, I mean, you have to design a, a building that meets all the required specifications and load demands, and on top of that, usually clients like the building to look kind of pretty, so um, aesthetic properties matter. Uh, the client's needs, what's the facility going to be used for? All that stuff matters uh, in material selection. So delving into this a little bit more, economic factors. Uh, raw material costs and availability, these are really big ones. I mean, uh, around uh, this region of the country and even as far as the West, you'll see steel used a lot more prevalently, prevalently than you will in regions like the Southwest, like Arizona and New Mexico, because it's just not as available out there. When you go to Hawaii, they're using nothing but concrete, because it's Hawaii, it's in the middle of nowhere. So that's what they have and that's, that's what they use. So things like uh, you know, availability, manufacturing costs, transportation costs, I mean steel, I, I keep going to steel because it's, uh, it's one of those materials that isn't uh, usually as readily available as something like concrete. You can find concrete plants all over the place. But um, steel is usually a much more efficient material, but there's a transportation cost associated with it, you know, so ultimately that needs to be weighed in. <laughs> um, uh, mechanical properties. Mechanical properties are things that you've probably seen before in other classes, things like uh, uh, the Young's modulus, the yield strength, the tensile strength. I mean, um, you know, the, the higher the stresses, the higher quality of material you might need. That's something that you're definitely going to, uh, to need to consider. Uh, aesthetic uh, 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 aspects, you know, what does the architect want? What are the economics uh, uh, drive? Is there some political aspect uh, uh, involved in your process? It happens. Um, as much as we would like to avoid that, uh, it, it, it sometimes uh, works its way in there. Uh, what materials are available? Uh, if you're working with a given contractor, what, um, what are they used to? That's a, that's a big one in, in, uh, in construction. You know, you have some new technology, some new system uh, that's implemented and developed, but um, maybe you find that the, the local workforce isn't really comfortable with using that, that system. That's, uh, that's definitely something that, uh, that needs to be considered. Um, so I, I just I wanted to, to, to give you all sort of a general, you know, 30,000 foot view of, you know, some, some important aspects with materials. But unfortunately, we do got to spend a little bit of time and talk about the math, talk about the concepts of stress and strain, you know, what you learned in Engineering 216, Mechanics of Deformable Bodies. Awesome stuff, right? I can see you all are having a hard time containing your excitement over the concept. Don't, don't worry. Uh, if it's been a while or if you're a little fuzzy on this stuff, don't worry. It, it's, uh, it's not so bad. Okay. So I want to talk about stress and strain. I want to redefine some of this stuff before you and why they are such fundamental concepts to what it is that we do, not only in this class, but in engineering uh, in general. So let's consider the, the following structure. I've got a, um, a beam. It's simply supported and it's subjected to some loads. It doesn't really matter what those loads are. And then uh, I use the, uh, uh, the secret weapon uh, of structural engineering, which I didn't tell you all in structural analysis yesterday. I almost want to slap my hand for that. But uh, some of my folks who've had me before know what the secret weapon of structural engineering is. It's a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. So, 30th birthday cake cake. 30th birthday. That's right. <laughs> that was a good day. All right. So if I'm sitting on this table and I cut right through here, or if, if he decides to use a samurai sword or a lightsaber and cut right through here, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to fall down to the ground. What's going to happen to his grade in the class? <laughs> the, point is, the point is that if you cut a section there, what's going to happen is the structure is going, going to become unstable and it's going to collapse. The reason why is because inside the structure at that particular point, 
there are a series of forces that are developed to keep the structure in equilibrium. Very, you know, fundamental concept of statics. Oh, I mentioned that word and onset of post-traumatic stress disorder just, just rears its ugly head. Um, if we look at this two-dimensionally, you know, if you have sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, and sum of moments, um, if I have, you know, three possible unknowns, there are three equations of equilibrium, that means I have three possible unknown forces inside that, inside that structure. So an unknown axial force, an unknown shear force, and an unknown bending moment, okay? And, that, and three equations of equilibrium will help you determine those three forces. And that's the gist of statics uh, in a nutshell. Um, the problem is, is that from a materials aspect, that's really not enough, okay? Because those forces are really going to be heavily dependent on the geometry of the structure. I want to try and remove the geometry aspect altogether. And what, what I mean by that is I want to remove the specifics of a given structural problem and just look at the material uh, itself. In other words, I want to try and arrive at some knowledge that's unique to just the material. You know, if I have a steel beam that's 20 foot long and a steel beam that's 50 foot long, they're two different steel beams, but ultimately they're made of steel. It's the same material. What I want to do is I want to learn more about the material. So I'm going to try and remove the geometry out of it. And one of the ways I'm going to remove the geometry is by looking at a concept called stress. So, um, you know, let's, let's keep this real simple. So if I've got uh, geometry, let's say I've got, I'm trying to compute volume. Um, how do you compute, uh, a simple way of computing volume is to take the cross-sectional area and multiply it by the length, right? So one of the ways that I can remove the geometry is by removing the area. And that's where stress comes into play. You've probably heard or dealt with concepts like this before. You're probably thinking in terms of pressure. The fluid mechanic folks, they, they tend to use pressure quite a bit. Us solid mechanics folks, we use stress. But instead of looking at forces, we tend to look at, in a course like this, we tend to look at forces over a given area. So instead of 100 pounds, we're interested in things like 100 pounds per square inch. That's stress in a nutshell. Um, you probably remember this from uh, deformable, you know, a normal stress and a shear stress. You all remember that? Um, in here, we're really more interested in the normal stress. That's really all we care about. Take an element, push on it. Take an element, yank on it. If I'm yanking on it with 100 pounds, it has a cross-sectional area of two square inches. That's 50 psi. That's what we're interested in. Okay? Everybody all right with that? <coughs> now, uh, technically, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let me, let me, I'll, I'll move past that and, and talk about this. Let's talk about units. We are, we are going to hop around uh, with units in this class between US and SI, just because in some of our laboratory testing environments, it sometimes does make a little more sense to, to work in SI than it does in U.S. units. I will say this as, uh, you know, when you're dealing with construction folks and contractors and even structural engineers, we're primarily using U.S. units here in the U.S. But again, in our laboratory environment, it sometimes makes sense to go to SI. Um, for stress, uh, if we're talking about U.S. units, I mean, you probably are very uh, familiar with PSI. Um, what you might not have heard of yet is KSI, kips per square inch. That is a very fundamental concept that us structural engineers use, so you might hear me use the term KSI a little bit. A kip is just 1,000 pounds if you haven't been exposed to that yet. Uh, and SI units, our fundamental unit of stress is the Pascal. It's newtons per meter squared. A uh, quick little shortcut, if you take a kilonewton and divide it by a millimeter squared, that will give you a gigapascal. So, that's one of the ones that I always have to go back and like, oh, what was that again? So I sort of put that on there just so you all would have a, a little bit of reference for it. Okay. Now, technically, stress uh, uh, is defined using those calculus terms. We take an element uh, of area, define the force uh, around it, and then take the limit as that area approaches zero. But we're not going to really be doing calculus in here, so we'll just use the average you know, stress force divided by area. So that's going to really be our, our fundamental uh, uh, stress formula that we're going to be using throughout the semester. Now that's stress. What about the, the flip side? What about strain? Remember that, 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 uh, that goal that we're trying to do. We're trying to remove the geometry aspect from the problem. In other words, if I've got, you know, 
one steel beam here and one steel beam here, I want to remove the geometrical aspects of those problems and just look at the material behavior, just look at steel. Well, I'm able to remove the cross-sectional area uh, aspect by introducing the concept of stress. To remove the length, I need to introduce the concept of strain. Okay, now you've probably seen this stuff before, but again, I want to go back and make sure everybody's uh, remembering what's going on. Strain is, is really nothing more than a percent change uh, in deformation. So let's say I have a bar, okay, and this bar is, I don't know, 10 inches long. And I take this bar and I yank on it to where its final length is 11 inches. So it was 10 inches long, now it's 11 inches long. How much longer did it get? One inch, right? So it got one inch longer. It originally was 10 inches longer, so it increased 10% in length. Everybody with me on that? Its strain is 10% or 0.1. That's strain in a nutshell, okay? So strain is defined as the change in length over the original length. Or if we want to look at this in a little bit more mathematical terms, if I have a bar and yank on it, you know, its original length, let's say it's delta x, its new length is delta x prime. So the difference between these two is going to be the change in length divided by the original length. There you go. That, that's it. That's strain in a nutshell. Okay? So anybody have any questions on that? Again, I'm, I'm the easiest person to get along with. You can raise your hand and say, what the heck are you talking about? I, I definitely want you all to feel that you can ask whatever you want. So if you ever have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, uh, and, and we can go through. Everybody good? All right. So change in length over the original length, that's the fundamental definition uh, of strain. Um, again, you know, if we wanted to get, uh, uh, if we wanted to get, you know, look at this from a calculus perspective, we're really talking about infinitesimal strain. So we're looking, you know, at that definition as that original length approaches, uh, approaches zero. And it's funny how that looks a little bit like a derivative. So from a calculus standpoint, strain is, the, is defined as the change in length over the original length or the derivative, the derivative of that uh, deformation with respect to, uh, uh, to the length. But we're not really worried about that in here. I mean, we're dealing with concrete cylinders and stuff like that. We're really just worried in, in average strain. So just deformation, change in length over the uh, original length. Because of the definition of strain, it has no units, okay? It's, you know, inches per inch or millimeters per millimeters or centimeter per centimeter. So the strain has no units. Very often you'll see me, if I've got a stress strain curve, I just won't report the units because it doesn't really matter. You could throw anything in there and the strain would be the same, okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Uh, another aspect that I think is worth mentioning is thermal uh, aspects. You know, when you take an object and you heat it up, it tends to expand. When objects cool down, uh, it tends to contract. So um, that is actually a, uh, a material-specific uh, quantity. We call, uh, um, we can relate that strain and that change uh, in deformation by a quantity called alpha. It's the coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, did you all do that in deformable? Did you all see that? <laughs> it's been a while. Okay. That, that's that's the answer, the official answer, right? It's been a while, right? Yeah. Been a while. <laughs> oh, somebody's got jokes. Um, okay. Um, so I know if you had me for deformable, I know we did that because uh, that's where I got this, this slide from. <laughs> um, so we'll probably get into this stuff a little bit more later. I just wanted to mention that you know, instead of taking an element and yanking on it, you know, pulling on it or, or, or compressing it, you can change a, an object's geometry by heating it up. That matters in our world as well. A lot, of, a lot of times I think civil engineers, they hear thermo and they just sort of, their brain turns off. They go, what in the heck do I care about this stuff for? But it matters in our world as well. For instance, if you have a bridge in West Virginia in the summer, you can get high 90s or even triple degree weather in the winter talking about ten zeros, maybe even below zero. What do you think is happening to that bridge throughout that year? It's expanding and contracting. So we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that with our uh, bearing uh, 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 fixtures that we design. 
Um, we have to make sure that our foundations, uh, if necessary, are able to withstand that, that, uh, that longitudinal translation. That matters. So it matters to us as well, and it's something that we need to, uh, to account for. Now, everybody good so far? Now, we're able to remove the geometry aspect of a given problem by looking at stress and strain. Okay? And what that does is it leads to a very fundamental relationship that we can define, which is called a stress-strain curve. In other words, if we take a piece of material and load it until failure, and we remove the geometry of that specific material, we can uh, derive a very fundamental piece of information about that material, and we call it a stress-strain curve. Now, I have a video here, and I'm going to show you uh, what a stress-strain tensile test looks like. I'm very comfortable with showing you this video because around week 9 or week 10 we're going to do this. So uh, this is something that we're going to come back to and do later on in the semester. But I want to pull this up and show you all what's going on in a, 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 a tensile test. And then we'll come back and sort of re-explain uh, everything that was discussed. So let me see. Um, my playback device, I think I need to switch that here. Okay. So hopefully this isn't too loud, but, but bear with me. All right. The tensile test. First test, material with yield point phenomenon. In the first tensile test, a coin harvester with yield point phenomenon is to be tested. This is the test.
recorded routes are not created by but one of the participants. All further cluster deformation now only takes place at the neck, and the next major test is at Gunther. Diagram for face F and H at the upper wheel plate can clearly be seen. This is the highest point the test is taking for the elastic plate. F and L is defined as the force at the lower wheel plate, F max as the maximum force. I'm actually going to go ahead and pause it right here. We'll probably end up using different notations, so, so that's, uh, that's no big deal. But when, when I was, uh, one question I want to ask before we start going back and getting into the definitions of, of some of the things that just happened. All right, let's make up a number. Let's say that this number was 50,000 pounds, the, the amount of force that was required to fail that given element. When I said take the geometry out of the situation, let's ask that question in a little bit of a simpler fashion. If this bar, like, so again, let's say this is 50,000 pounds. If that bar was twice that size, would that be 50,000 pounds? Maybe it would be 100,000 pounds. See what I mean? That's the idea of taking the geometry out of the problem, okay? So that we're not looking at just that particular sample, but we're generating some information about steel in general, okay? So this force elongation curve, this is looking at the force and the distance, the amount of distance that it elongated. If I took the force and divided it by the area and took the, the change in length and divided it by the original length, I would generate a stress-strain curve. Okay, Does that make sense? That's what we're after. That's the fundamental uh, uh, relationship that we need to define for this material because the idea is that if we can understand some properties about that particular material, then that material could be a bracket or a beam or configured in any way, shape, or form, and we can understand its fundamental properties. That's the general idea. That's what we're sort of after uh, in this science. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Now, I want to talk about the specifics of, of what happened here in a little more detail um, and, and raise some, some very uh, significant points. So. What I have here are some images of some example testing materials. So these are more for alloys, and you can uh, see, like what was uh, happening in the video, those tests tend to be tensile tests. They tend to be yanked on. The ones on the left, are uh, those are essentially concrete testing cylinders, and they are meant to be compressed. Concrete is a material, as you will uh, uh, understand throughout the semester and if you take reinforced concrete design. Concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in compression but very, very poorly in tension. So uh, it stands to reason that the standardized sample that we cast for concrete is a sample that is meant to be compressed and that's, that's what you see right here. Now, the big point to, uh, um, the big point to mention is this. So we agreed that if I took that piece of steel that was in that video and I quote unquote doubled its size, that forces not would double. But if I go and back calculate what the stress is and what the strain is, it will theoretically all be the same, right? That makes sense? Okay. That's why a stress strain curve is, is so fundamental. Because stress strain curves are unique to a given material. Once you take the geometry out of it, we're looking solely at the material. This is a typical stress strain curve for steel. The one on the right, that's a typical stress strain curve for an aluminum alloy. They are different, not because the original samples were the same size or different size, that doesn't matter. They're different because they're different materials, okay? Each material is gonna have its own different response that we need to understand in order to appropriately design with these materials because that's the next step. The next step is to take this low carbon steel and let's say it's reinforcement, well how much rebar needs to go in that beam in order to safely resist those loads? How many steel bolts need to go in that connection uh, and what have you? That's the point. That's what we're after uh, in this particular science. Okay. Now, uh, 
probably the most fundamental stress strain curve that we use for instructional purposes in any engineering concept anywhere is the one for steel, okay? So let's look at a stress strain curve for steel. That is a, that, that right there is a stress strain curve for steel. That's the one that we just saw in that video. What I want to do is I want to take that stress strain curve and I want to break it apart piece by piece and I want to, um, to, to you know, dissect its components, what's going on with it uh, and, and how it behaves. So I've got here, uh, if you look at the stress strain curve, there are a series of points. So for instance, this is point OA and then we've got AB, BC, CD and so on and so forth. Let's talk about this first region. So this first region from the beginning, the origin, O, uh, to this point A. And if you notice, the stress strain curve is very linear in nature. Okay? This is the linear region of the stress strain curve. It's also termed the elastic region of the stress strain curve. If I've got a rubber band in my hand, and I take that rubber band and I stretch it a little bit, I let go, what happens to the rubber band? It snaps back, right? But not only does it snap back, it snaps back in the exact same shape, right? When it was all said and done, it didn't change its shape. It's still, for, for better or worse, it's the same rubber band, right? Make sense? Now, I'm talking about just taking it and stretching it a little bit. I'm not talking about doing this to where it snaps in half. I'm just talking about stretching it a little bit. We call that region of material behavior the elastic behavior. In other words, if I loaded this, this piece of material a little bit, and let it go, it would snap back along that linear path to its original location. That is the definition of elastic behavior. And for materials with a linear region like steel, if we look at this linear region, you all remember graphing, right? Change in Y over change in X has a very specific name. We call that slope, right? Well, for materials, the slope of that elastic region is a very, very special term. And we call that the modulus of elasticity. Sometimes it's called the Young's modulus after Thomas Young, who was a scientist and engineer back in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, you'll probably hear me use the term interchangeably, Young's modulus, elastic modulus. But that's essentially what that quantity is. It is the relationship in that linear region from the uh, amount of applied stress and the resulting amount of strain. I mean, if I take a rubber band and I put 10 pounds on it, I can probably get a fair amount of deformation in a rubber band, right? If I had a piece of steel, uh, you know, that thick, I mean, I know I'm a very physically intimidating guy, but I don't think I can get the... <laughs> see, I, very cheesy jokes. This is what you all are in store for. And for, for many of you, like five days a week, you're going to deal with me every day. But imagine, if I had a rubber band and I applied 10 pounds, it's going to respond very differently than, let's say, a piece of high carbon steel. It's not going to be as easy to get the same amount of deformation, right? That's because steel has a much higher Young's modulus or elastic modulus than the material in a rubber band. Does that make sense? That is a material characteristic, okay? It's going to be easier to deform, let's say, a piece of uh, aluminum or a piece of wood than it is a piece of steel in the elastic region because the elastic modulus is much lower. Okay? Make sense? Now, some of these numbers might seem a little odd, or a little odd in terms of their magnitude. I mean, the Young's modulus for steel, you know, we're looking at 29 million PSI. You're going, really? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, steel. You can take steel and apply, you know, thousands and thousands of PSIs and only get, you know, fractions of a percent in, uh, in deformation. Well, you take, do the division, and yeah, you get about 29 million PSI. So structural steel has a very constant uh, Young's modulus of 29 million. Uh, some materials like, like wood, I mean, it depends on the species of wood. You know, uh, aluminum, it's going to depend on the particular alloy. Concrete, it's going to pretend on the different mix. So these, these values are a little bit out of range. It's one of the reasons why you're in this class, given a, uh, given a particular concrete mix or a given uh, sample of aluminum or whatnot, the idea is to do the test and determine what is the Young's modulus. You know, it, th this is a very fundamental aspect of what we're doing in this class. If you're on a construction site and you're placing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards of concrete for some particular 
uh, bridge or building or what have you. The idea is to draw off a particular sample and do quality tests to ensure that the material is performing according to specifications. That's sort of why you're learning what you're learning in this class. This is sort of, uh, this is sort of the point. Um, okay, so <clears throat> one point I will mention about elastic behavior. Some materials present very linear elastic behavior like steel. I mean that, that elastic region is a straight line. Some materials don't. Some materials, the, the stress strain curve is very nonlinear. One material where the stress strain curve is very nonlinear is concrete. Concrete has a very nonlinear uh, stress strain curve. For you folks who took me for concrete design, remember 0.85 FC prime, that's why we use 0.85 FC prime was because uh, concrete has a very nonlinear stress strain relationship. Not to say it doesn't behave elastically, it's just not in a linear fashion. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, some materials, uh, if, you go to, if you go back to this curve, you, know, you notice the material behaves linearly up until a certain point. Okay? For steel, that's a pretty easy point to determine. We call that the yield point. Some materials like uh, aluminum or aluminum alloys, they don't really have a, a, a defined sort of plateau. They just sort of soften as they go. From a design aspect, sometimes we need a value. We have to use a value or, or define a value in order to, uh, for design purposes. So um, there's a couple different ways of going about that. One of the most common is what's called 0.2% offset. So what we do is we draw our stress strain curve and we say, all right, let's go out a little bit. Let's go out 0.2% uh, or 0 0.002 on the strain curve, shoot a line up that's kind of at that same slope and whatever that intersection is, that's sort of our maximum stress that we're going to allow that material to use. And it's really uh, uh, common, especially in materials that don't have a very well-defined yield point. I mean, some do, some don't. It just, it just depends on the material uh, that you're looking at. Everybody good with that so far? So far so good? Okay. Again, if you've got any questions, please uh, feel free. Um, uh, in terms of Young's modulus, there's a couple different ways that you can assess what the Young's modulus is or the elastic modulus. Um, <clears throat> and it just depends on the material and the application that you're looking at. Maybe you start out, maybe you look at a tangent modulus. So you, you calculus folks will remember this. Let me see if my, my pen is working. So, hey, it's working. Okay, so, you know, I, I, I'll draw this line that's tangent to that curve right at the beginning and say, okay, that's my Young's modulus. I mean, sometimes you need a value for purposes of calculation, so you've got to define something. Maybe what you'll do is you'll say, you know what, let's just take that starting point, let's find a pretty close intersection and we'll use that. Or maybe we'll go forward uh, a little farther up on a chord modulus or just try and define a tangent modulus somewhere up, uh, somewhere up on the curve. I don't, I don't want to delve too heavily into that. I mean, you're starting to get into some, some a, a little bit more of the esoteric stuff. We have some pretty uh, straightforward methods that we can use in civil engineering and some empirical uh, approaches that we can use to define uh, the Young's modulus for certain materials. I keep going back to concrete because concrete is, is one of those very common materials. It's very nonlinear. But um, when you start looking at concrete, there are a lot of very simple relationships that are defined uh, in order to, to calculate this stuff. For instance, uh, with concrete, if you look at the maximum stress on that curve, which we call FC prime, which my, I know my concrete folks, they remember that. But if you take FC prime, there are a lot of relationships associated with that value to determine some of these quantities. Like if you take 57,000 times the square root, that'll give you Young's modulus. So it's, it's at least a very uh, empirical approach. We'll get to this stuff as we move forward throughout the semester. I just want you to understand that there's differing ways of defining uh, these quantities, as you can see. Okay. <coughs> now, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with this uh, particular steel uh, uh, sample in this test. So let's say you've got this particular piece of material you're yanking on, okay? Again, for the first part of the test and for the first part of its behavior, it's behaving a lot like a rubber band, okay? 
and a lot like a rubber band uh, in the sense that if you load it, let it go, it goes back to the way it was. That's linear elastic behavior. And let me be clear, in most design aspects, we do our best to try and ensure that materials behave linearly. We don't want you know, permanent deformations throughout the life of a structure. Some, sometimes they're necessary, uh, but many times we try and avoid it. But if we do get permanent deformations, this is what's going to happen. So not to get into chemistry too much. I know you, uh, it's a topic that also excites you all a lot. I love chemistry, right? Not to get, not to get too exciting. Um, but steel is a metallic alloy. And so you, you can almost think, you know, it, it's basically this big grid of a crystalline structure of atoms and molecules, right? I'm sure you all can sort of visualize that. As you load a, a piece of steel, you're stretching those bonds between the atoms and molecules, right? Make sense? I mean, you take a piece of steel, you load it, those molecules stretch out a little further, the bonds get a little stretched, right? Over time, once the stretches get a little too large, the bonds start to break a little bit. And once those bonds start to break, you'll find that the material starts to shift around and realign a little bit, and it starts to deform permanently. We call that yielding. Um, it's a very easy process to visualize if you think of something like a paper clip. If you've got a paper clip in your hand, a paper clip is something that's pretty easy to deform. I mean, you can take it and bend it pretty easily. Now, if you take a paper clip and bend it very, very lightly, it'll sort of snap back the way it was, right? You can almost kind of feel it if you take a paper clip and just sort of slowly start to bend it. You can sort of feel that point when it kind of gives, you know, and it just starts to go, and then now that deformation is locked in. You know what I'm talking about? And just, just you know, think about it. You can kind of see, uh, see that happen. And a paper clip's a perfect example because it's something you can do with your hands. That's what's sort of going on right here in this particular region. You get to a point where you start to snap those bonds, and the steel just kind of starts to give and it starts to freely uh, deform. This particular point or this particular phenomenon is what's called yielding and it happens at a very particular stress. Uh, we call that stress the yield stress. The yield stress varies depending on the type of steel that you're looking at. Steel comes in various grades. So for instance, grade A36 steel yields at about 36 kips per square inch or 36, yeah, 36,000 PSI. Other types of steel, for instance, like rebar, very common grades of rebar yield at about 60 KSI or 60,000 uh, PSI. So it just depends on the, uh, uh, the grade of steel that you're looking at. <coughs> Everybody okay with that? Now, the, the very important point to mention is that once you have deformed that thing permanently and you let that load go, it will respond it will respond back in an elastic fashion. So it goes back and it unloads at that same rate. I mean, I think, again, go back to the paper clip. I mean, you can go and you can deform that paper clip permanently, but once you let it go, it is still a paper clip. You're still going to be able to deform it a little bit. It'll still respond exactly like you would expect a, a paper clip to. So it's going to deform or it's going to respond at that linear elastic rate. So if you remove that load, it's going to uh, respond linearly uh, again. Everybody okay with that? Am I good? Okay. Um, let me know, let, let me also say this, I've been sort of, I, I can talk about this stuff all day. Um, I know, I, I've got a lot of people taking notes. If you need me to go back a slide, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. We're in no hurry. So if you need me to go back, just let me know. Uh, again, though, I am also recording it, so if there's something that you miss, uh, no big deal. Everybody good? Okay. All right. So once you, uh, once you, uh, the, 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 those bonds and those uh, uh, alignments between the atoms and molecules sort of realign, the structure can again begin to accept load, and it keeps doing that until we start to see the onset of failure. Now, the easiest way to describe elastic and inelastic behavior is kind of like uh, this. Elastic behavior again is a lot like the rubber band. If I load the rubber band and let it go, it goes back to the way it was. Inelastic behavior, I think the easiest way to describe that is almost something like a, like a piece of chewing gum. Like imagine you're chewing a piece of chewing gum and you take it and you stretch it, right? What happens? It's stuck that way, right? Like you don't, you don't just take it and let it go to snaps back to the way it was. You've permanently deformed that piece of gum, right? 
The same thing can happen in, uh, 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 in, in elements and things like that, things like plastic. You know, you can imagine if you've got some piece of plastic and you bend it, it's sort of stuck that way, right? So there's permanent deformations. That's what's sort of going on in all of this region up here, this, this, uh, this region of inelastic uh, behavior. Steel is a material that can accept a very, very large amount of inelastic uh, deformation. Uh, it, the ability of a material to withstand large amounts of inelastic deformation is what's called ductility. Steel is a very ductile material. It can bend and deform and accept a lot of those, uh, those inelastic deformations quite well, which make it a very uh, optimum uh, material choice if you're going to see a lot of those deformations. For instance, steel is a very, very popular choice for systems that are designed to withstand earthquake loads. Because in earthquakes, you are seeing a lot of force at a very quick rate. So you need a material that is very, very ductile that can withstand those large amounts of deformations. Concrete, on the other hand, is a more brittle material. Ductility and, and something being ductile and something being brittle are, are the exact opposites of one another. Once concrete reaches its ultimate capacity, it's done. It cracks and boom. Uh, when we do cylinder tests, um, uh, they can be quite loud and quite uh, destructive. So uh, that's just a, a fundamental uh, property uh, of concrete. So it's just something I thought I, I would mention. Um, everybody good so far? Okay. Going back to the, uh, the stress-strain curve, so uh, steel will continue to respond until it hits its ultimate capacity or its ultimate tensile stress. We call that sigma sub u or f sub u. Um, and again, that, that, if we're talking about steel, that's just, again, a function of the given material. A36 steel has a different uh, ultimate tensile stress than uh, A572 grade 50 or A992. It just depends on the grade that you're looking at. <coughs> you can tell that an element is starting to, to give up when it begins a process called necking. So you're taking the element and you're applying a very, very large amount of stress Again, those, those molecular bonds are starting to slip and give, and failure or the onset of failure or fracture really begins. You can kind of see the, the center of the bar starting, it's called necking. It starts to thin and, and uh, uh, thin, and you can see it, it's about to go, and then you keep loading, keep loading, and then you see full fracture, and this actually separates, and the element uh, is done. Everybody good with that? Everybody okay so far? Okay, <clears throat> again, the main benefit of this type of uh, stress-strain curve or of this type of, of data and information is that it's unique to a given material. I developed this stress-strain curve by testing a piece of steel. If I test a different piece of steel or a piece of steel that's bigger or smaller, because I've taken the geometry out, same data, okay? That's what makes this concept and this data uh, so important and so uh, interesting. And again, it all goes back to P over A and change in length over the original length. Yes, sir? Do everyday temperatures affect that stress strain curve area? That, that's a good question. Um, I'll say this for a material like steel, no. But there are materials where, yes, it actually can. Um, a lot of the newer materials that you, you know, like you'll see fiber reinforced composites and polymers and things like that. Um, where temperature isn't as big of a deal for steel, in the, and it can be for, for other materials. Now let me say this, I'm not saying that, that steel temp, uh, temperature doesn't affect steel, it certainly does, but it takes a fair amount of temperature to start um, seeing decay in, in an element's uh, mechanical properties. Usually once you hit around, say, I mean we're talking like a thousand to 1200 degrees or something like that, then you start to see some serious onset of, of decrease in mechanical properties. What ends up happening is that your Young's modulus just shoots down. Does that make sense? But I'll say this, under, um, under normal temperate conditions, I, a, a piece of steel generally is not going to behave differently you know, in 100 degree weather versus 10 degree weather, but it, it still can expand and contract. I, I, don't, I don't want you to get those two confused, okay? But it's still gonna fail at about the same yield stress. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is everybody else okay with that? Everybody else good? 
Um, let me see. You know what? I'll tell you what. Uh, we're starting to get to like 135, 140, something like that. We're actually getting pretty far ahead in terms of our material. We're actually a little further than I thought we were going to be. Maybe it's just because I'm so excited about steel. I've just been going on and on and rambling. Um, let me say this. Um, I don't want to get into information overload on the first day, and we've got plenty of time to talk about this stuff as we move forward. So I'm actually going to call it, but let me say this before we leave. Um, I'm going to be giving you all a homework assignment on Thursday, and I'm giving you a, a, a fair amount of time on it. I believe I'm giving you either a week and a half or two weeks. I have to go back to, to my notes that I've kept. Um, but it is going to make very extensive use of these fundamental concepts. So I want to make sure that you all are comfortable with them. I'm giving you a fair amount of time because I do want you to have the opportunity to ask questions, okay? So let me say this. We only meet two days a week. So um, I, I think the message that I'm trying to get across is don't wait until the last minute. Like the first moment in class, the first thing I want to do is say, all right, does anybody have any questions about the homework? And if you've got questions, you know, we can talk about it as a group so that way everybody hears about it. It's on the recording and all that. I want everybody to, uh, to get that benefit. But for that to happen, I'm not saying you need to have the homework done as soon as I assign it, but you at least want to start looking at it and start moving uh, forward with it. You don't want the last day, you know, your last chance to ask questions come up and you haven't even started it. I mean, it's not going to make for a fun time during the homework anyways. I mean, uh, I know some of my folks who've had me for concrete and steel design, like that concrete, that beam design homework, the huge one. So, now, it's not statics though, is it? It's not, it's not statics. <laughs> yes, sir. They're book problems. Um, but let me also say this. So your first homework assignment is going to have, I think it's like four problems. Yeah, it's four problems out of the book. But then the fifth problem is going to be just turning your data sheet from our first lab. So th that's, that's one of the reasons where I was saying your labs and your homeworks are going to kind of be mixed. Because instead of you all having two or three different submissions, just submit it all at once. You know, just makes it a little easier for everybody to keep track of it, especially when you got other classes and all that. Try and keep it as simple as we can. But yeah, it is going to come out of the book, but it's not going to be due for a little while, so you've got time to get the book. So, yeah. Any other questions? Did everybody sign the sheet? Okay. I will go to the office up there and ask them if the room was fixed for Engineering 104. <laughs> they were like, what's this dude talking about? <laughs> all right. With that, that's all I got. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. All right, we'll see you all on Thursday. And again, hey, closed-toed shoes. Make sure you bring closed-toed shoes for lab. <laughs>